Hi, and welcome to Danny After Dark. If you're new here, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a notification or a new episode. Tonight, we have a very, very special guest. We have Nicholas Schreck. You might know him as the author of The Manson File. However, did you know he had a relationship with the one, the only Richard Ramirez? Yes, that Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. So we have Nicholas here to enlighten us a little bit on who Richard Ramirez really was behind the scenes. So let's go ahead and welcome on Nicholas Shrek. Hello Hi, there. Nicholas. Hi, how are you tonight? Good. And yourself? I am relatively well, all things considering the state of the world. I am doing pretty good considering. So awesome. Well, thank you for being here. And I'm very excited for this. Um, cause I didn't prior to us talking, you know, through the Manson case, I did not know that you had a relationship with Richard Ramirez. So I'm really looking forward to asking you some questions about that as well as about your background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's my pleasure to be here and, uh, fire away. You can start your interrogation now. <laughs> I won't hurt. I promise. So that's too bad. I was hoping you would. Oh, I'll message you later. <laughs> Um, how did you come to get to know Richard Ramirez? How did that come about? All right. Well, behind me here is the first letter he sent me. And um, as some of your viewers may know, that is a goetic seal from the Seal of Solomon, which has 72 goetic demons in it, which is commonly used for black magical ritual. And he, I, I wrote to him, because I was working on a book in 1988 called The Demonic Revolution, and this was at the height of the satanic panic, and I was working on a book that basically interviewed everybody in the occult and satanic world that was still active at that time. So that is how I came to meet Anton LaVey. Um, I, you know, I, I won't name everyone because I don't want it to, to get too digressing into the whole occult world but basically i interviewed everybody in the occult world that existed at that time um and i wanted to have a chapter it was during the satanic panic which maybe your younger viewers may not know fully it was a time when christian televangelism especially was pushing the idea during the reagan administration that was very dominated by christian evangelical born again thinking that there was a satanic conspiracy throughout America, that babies were being killed, that there was a, you know, a, a, um, it was, it was in very many ways, the embryo of QAnon, a lot of the same insane and unfounded ideas that, yeah. that fuel QAnon. And we thought we had defeated it, but it's back and, and it's worse than ever. So I think it's very, very timely that we talk about this tonight. Mm -hmm. So in that context of the satanic panic, uh, my band Radio Werewolf was very controversial and very much, you know, I was very much a target of the beginning of the satanic panic thing. And Satanists, traditional Satanists, if you can call them that, were very concerned with painting themselves in a good light and, and disassociating themselves from these rumors of sacrifice and ritual murder and all of that, which was not happening. However, there I did want to have a chapter in my book about satanic crime through the ages, because of course, Satanists have killed people. Satanists have, you know, it's, it's ridiculous to whitewash it. Uh, there have been Satanists through history who have certainly lived up to their reputation. And one of them was Richard, who um, you know, who, who had absolutely no remorse about his crimes, who identified as a Satanist proudly. So I wanted to get his perspective on it, which annoyed the kind of nice, politically correct Satanist that would prefer that we not mention that. But I've never wanted to, uh, to whitewash things. So I contacted him. And as a kind of prelude to all that, in 1984, when I was living in Los Angeles and I started the band Radio Werewolf, which pushed itself very deliberately as the most evil band in history 
and deliberately played up all of the satanic panic fears of backward masking and being controlled by a secret society and using the concerts as rituals, which were true. It was true that we were, but we did it in an ironic way, almost parodying the fears of the satanic panic and, and, and wanting to be the essence of everything that people feared about occult rock music. So when we started in 1984, uh, Richard was starting his own little art project as the Night Stalker. So in the, 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 the mood in Los Angeles when Radio Werewolf started was terror and fear because the so-called Valley Intruder, which is what he was first known as, and then later the Night Stalker, you can't imagine how much you know, genuine fear there was because people had no idea. There didn't seem to be any pattern of who it would strike or why or when or if it was a group of people. And then um, there started to be in the newspapers the reporting that sat satanic graffiti and, and occult symbols were left at the crime scene. And this is where it became personal because of my prominence in Los Angeles as an outspoken Satanist, there were people, including friends of mine, who wondered if I was the Valley Intruder or the Night Stalker. What? And yes, and, uh, and that wasn't the first time. I'll, I'll mention something else that was a previous serial killer thing. So people jokingly, but not completely jokingly, wondered and, and asked me and, um, and later, when I told Richard that, he thought it was hilarious. Uh, he got a laugh out of that. But um, So it was personal to me. I followed the case, for one thing, because the Satanism angle, of course, impinged on my own life during this satanic panic thing. That was the last thing I needed, was to be uh, associated with the idea that Satanists are going around killing people when that's what the police and, and, and the Reagan... Reaganized, born again, Christian right were saying. So I was very aware of it. And um, to make a long story short, I'm working on this book, The Demonic Revolution, and then I, I thought there needs to be a chapter about real satanic crime to, to balance and, and put it in perspective. So he, I wrote to him and he wrote back very quickly. And this letter behind me is from February of 1988 that's when he wrote to me and i had just moved to san francisco and again there was a personal connection my girlfriend and i were living in a beautiful um, old vintage apartment house but it was in the tenderloin which is a notoriously violent and was then very, very you know filled with street prostitution drug dealers but it was a beautiful building and so we loved this building so we moved to the tenderloin well unbeknownst to me that is where richard's probably his first victim which i never knew about in the time we knew him this nine-year-old girl who he raped and killed and left hanging in a basement very nearby to where i was living wow. in the tenderloin so that was another strange connection and i didn't know that during the he he and even though he was quite open about his crimes, he never told us about that. And it wasn't known until years later, as you may know. It, it was. I don't know how familiar you are with his crimes, but that wasn't a crime he was charged with. Yeah. So the Tenderloin, you know, it was a very violent uh, area filled with street people that were mentally ill, prostitutes, drug dealers. So it was certainly colorful. You could use the euphemism for that. And um, so that's where this letter behind me first came. He answered it and he was quite enthusiastic to meet me. And um, we started speaking on the phone. And the first thing we talked about was this symbol, which is the goetic seal for the demon Belial um, among the 72 demons. And we started talking, and I had used this as a black magician and devil worshiper. I had used the Goetic system very often. And only a few years earlier, I had done a ritual using the Goetic 
system in in um, Philadelphia, a group satanic ritual that was very dramatic. And I won't get into all the details because it would digress from Ramirez. But I feel at that time that I was actually possessed by what we called up. It was an extremely dramatic ritual. And everyone involved with that ritual is dead except for me and one other person. And they, it, it definitely was, you know, it brought something from another world into the place where we did this ritual. And I stopped working with the Goetic demons after that, after seeing, I had done a lot of work with them. So our first conversation and most of our conversations were not about his crimes, though we did get into them later and I'll explain why. Our first conversations were about the Goetic system, about demons. He too felt that he had been possessed and he described the feeling of it. And he had done, I mean, he was not, he didn't have a tutor. He didn't have any mentor or guide in these things. He just sort of did do it yourself rituals because he was attracted to, you know, black magic and the devil. So that was, and that's what brought, I, I'm not particularly interested in true crime. I'm not particularly interested in murderers per se. I mean, I've known maybe because I've known criminals all my life. I don't find anything romantic about them or fascinating. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, I've, I've known all kinds of crooks and criminals and murderers and uh, it's not, it's not something, you know, but I was, so the only reason I was interested in him was not because of his crimes, but because of his open, blatant admission of guilt of his, it's very rare that, you know, he said, I want to be evil and that I'm, I did these things to be evil. And, and what he told me was that he, he believed he would be rewarded in hell by Satan for, for his bad deeds. And this is something I've seen with a lot of people that are, are actually the most authentic, real Satanism I've encountered. It was in Italy, Mexico, Spain, countries that are very Catholic have a kind of Satanism where they invert it, they invert Catholicism, and, and their form of Satanism is like an upside-down Catholicism. So he believed if he did evil deeds, then Satan would, would reward him in the afterlife, which is not, in case anyone thinks that's true, I can also tell you that's not true. And I'll get into that very specifically about hell and Richard Ramirez, and, and that you don't get a reward for doing what he did. Yeah. Just in case anyone thinks it's a good idea out there. Um, yeah, we don't want others to think that's a good idea right, to go to that right, because they right. do that here. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, yeah, so we talked about, you know, conjuring of demons and the devil, and and he, he was a bit older than me, but he looked at me in a way like a mentor or a guide because he didn't, Previously, he really didn't know anyone who was knowledgeable about these things. Um, so, yeah, so our first discussions were about that. And it took a while. I, I then moved, after I moved from San Francisco and after I married Zena LeVay, who then became Zena Shrek and remained so, um, we, I, his trial was starting, and so that was when I finally was able to visit him. And we visited him, and I actually brought with me the, the notes that we took that day. The, I'll, I'll read a little bit of the first page. Yes. So these are, these are the actual notes from 1988, February, wow. no, or 1989, February of 1989. And this is what we brought into the L.A. County Jail, where he was, and we went in to speak to him, and um, there were many Richard Ramirez's in county jail in Los Angeles, many, Ricardo Ramirez, so it took a while to find the right one, and then the guard took us to the, to the you know, looked like a, like an auto repair garage, very bare, desolate room where he was brought out, and uh, we spoke to him, you know, with glass and with, with a telephone, a little bit like this. And um, 
and he came out and he was extremely he was in a very good mood that day i mean i think he, he was glad to see us of course he knew who we were yeah. and he respected us and he he looked up to us so i think we saw a very different side of him than other people who visited him because he's i mean I, in a weird way to say he saw us as equal he he even looked up to us a little bit as and for the most part he didn't respect anybody yeah um so we had attended the trial for quite a while before we actually were able to visit him. We had gone, we went to most of his trial. Um, and That's what I was going to clarify. So your conversations with him were before the trial? No, they were, they were during. They during, were, they sorry, were that's during. what I meant to say. They yes. were during. Okay. They, they were the early part of the trial. Um, okay. So we had gone, I don't remember how long, but for many, many sessions of the trial, and he, the first time we went into the courtroom, he waved to us and everybody, of course, noticed that. And there were, you know, the news media was there, the, the local Los Angeles news networks, and they recognized us because we were on television about the satanic panic all the time. So, so um, they very, some of the news people politely came up to us and, and there was a news episode. Unfortunately, I have it on video. I, I haven't transferred it to digital where they didn't really do it in any sensational way, but they said, well, look who's here at the Richard Ramirez trial, which implied there must be some connection, which of course there wasn't. But there have always been rumors, you know, did we know him before, you know, was he following our, orders or nonsense like this that you always get with such things but so um i one of the first things he said when, when we went to the trial the first day i was wearing a long black leather coat and i remember one of the earliest things he said when we sat down and talked to him he said oh man nicholas when you came in i thought you're going to take out a gun and shoot everybody and that I mean, that's how he thought, and that at first is what he thought we were like. He did think, he clearly thought we were getting away with what he didn't. Mm. For instance, Sina at that time taught, she still teaches students, but now she's a Buddhist yogini, but then she taught black magic to private students. And he said, oh, to Sina during our first meeting, oh, I wish I'd known that, because maybe I wouldn't be in jail now. He thought he thought, you know, we were teaching people how to get away with murder, which we assured <laughs> him we assured him we weren't. But I don't think he ever believed us. I think he said, yeah, sure, you're you're saying that because you're here in jail. Of course, you're not going to admit wow. that. I think he eventually understood that we were not. But who knows? So just uh, just to make it totally uh, cinema verite, here is exactly like the first things he said. He greeted us. These are notes I took during and right after. Okay. And again, we, you know, we didn't just get right into the crimes at all or anything like that. The, the, he, very, he was very charming, in a good mood, cheerful. I, I would say he was kind of boyishly enthusiastic even in our first meeting. And he told us, he was reading these books, The Black Arts by Richard Cavendish, which is a popular book about black magic satan wants you by art lyons which was a book that had come out a year before about contemporary satanism in general um, i made a note that in public he was very somber and unsmiling and in private he smiled and was affable and friendly so it was very clear the way you've seen all the the, the footage of him in yeah. court He's he definitely, he very shrewdly and cannily had an idea of his self-image. And he played this character mm -hmm. of the Night Stalker when he when the news cameras were on and in the trial. And, um, and he wanted to intimidate people. He wanted to frighten people. He wanted to provoke people deliberately, you know. And, but, when, but privately, he was nothing like that. You know, so the image you have of what you've seen in the court appearances, it's not like he was somber and sullen and, you know, playing up the sinister image that he played. Um, he, we talked about the, 
the hearing and what he thought of it, and he said he wanted the death penalty. He wanted to be killed. He did not want to live. Um, he made it very clear that what he thought would happen is that eventually the cop, he couldn't believe that it took so long for him to be arrested, actually. Uh, and what he hoped, he told us in detail, what his, what his idea of what would happen is that the police would find him, he would get into a shootout with the police, and they would kill him in a shootout, and, mm -hmm. and that would be it. And, and I think the interesting thing about that, I think, not, like a few other serial killers, I think that his crimes were a kind of suicidal action. I mean, I think he was very lonely. I think he, I think he had a very miserable life. And I, I think even though he was in his mid-20s when he started the killing spree, I think he wanted to be killed. I think he had a, a very strong death wish. And he was really pissed off that he was caught. And I don't know if your viewers know the way he was caught is uh, he was in Arizona briefly. He went to Arizona and when he came back, someone had identified him by his name and they put a picture of him. And when he got back to LA, his pictures all over the newspapers and it was on the Spanish, the main Spanish speaking Los Angeles newspaper. And he was in a Mexican neighborhood and the local Mexicans on the street recognized him, saw him, chased him and nearly beat him to death. If the, if somebody hadn't called the police, he probably would have not gone to prison because they, I mean, they really hated him and they hated him because he was right. Mexican and, and shaming the whole Mexican community. And, and, you know, in Los Angeles, there's a lot of hatred, of whites to Mexican, and it was even more blatant then. So that would only perpetuate the uh, their reputation. So they really hated him, and also they're very extremely Catholic and extremely conservative. So they they nearly beat him to death, and he barely survived that. The police did he tell you about like talk to you about oh, yeah. that beating? Yes, he he did, and I'll get into why he did. So. Then he, he said, uh, they want to save me, laughingly, speaking of his attorneys. But he didn't want his defense to save him. He wanted the death penalty. And that led pretty quickly, the, as far as the death penalty, which we were all sure he would get. We had no doubt he would because he was guilty as hell, literally. Um, and there was so much evidence and, and he didn't deny it. So he wanted... You know, in America, you're, you are allowed to choose the religious uh, chaplain or representative to go with you to your death. You can, you can be accompanied by someone. And he wanted Zena, who was then the high priestess of the Church of Satan when we were visiting him, to be the person who spoke to him before he died and brought him to what would have been the gas chamber in San Quentin, where, where he most likely and was uh, sentenced to. So she agreed to do that, and that was the plan. Um, he said, I don't plan on being on this earth for too long. I'd give myself four years. I don't know what he meant by that, but, you know, Interesting. he definitely did not want to live, and he made it clear he hated being in jail. He never wanted to be. He had been before for auto theft and other minor crimes, but he absolutely hated it. Um, he said, what kind of life am I going to have here? Only The only choices are life imprisonment without parole and the death penalty, and I would rather have the death penalty. Uh, he said, they don't want me on the streets again, laughingly. Um, he wrote about getting letters from Christians trying to get him to repent and to to accept jesus as a savior and he he rolled his eyes disdainfully um i don't know if you remember the sean sellers case that was very popular at the time it was it's this the um say you love satan case it was it was a it was another teenage um murder thing that the media turned into a satanic crime thing which it really wasn't but and, and it was very popular at that time. And, and um, Richard said of that, that's stupid. And then 
another thing about him, he was very aware of his celebrity. For someone, you know, he moved to L.A. when he was 15 years old, and basically from 15 to when he was arrested, he lived like a feral animal. I mean, he didn't even really have a human existence. He, li he lived in cars or, you know, the cheapest boarding rooms. He owned almost nothing. He hardly had any real friends. He knew a few people in the underworld who he would, uh, you know, buy cocaine and heroin and speed and whatever from. And he knew other crooks and criminals. And he, and he was an auto thief and you know he did ordinary crimes and broke into people's houses just to, to steal stuff to buy drugs but his you know he got up at night and went out and prowling and stealing he had no friends he was never socialized you know he had no so so jail in a way was his first kind of socialization I mean he I really thought of any any when I first saw him, he came, he was like visiting a wild animal in jail. Interesting. He, and not only that, I do believe he was actually possessed for a while by the demons that he worked with. I do believe, I think it stopped, but I think when he was first arrested, he was. And if you see um, when he's being asked by the cops, when victims are identifying him, and for instance, there's a footage of him where the, where one of them, where the cops are say, asking him to repeat what he'd said, which is, show me the money, bitch, or where's the money, bitch. He's yeah. clearly, to me, to someone who has experience with esoteric forces, uh, he is still in the grip of some demonic force. Interesting. And, and, and I can relate to him on that level. And we did have a rapport. I mean, we did get along. Not that I condoned what he did in any way, but there mm -hmm. was some kind of fraternal rapport between us, which is why he trusted me and why he opened up. Yeah. Um, so as far as him being very shrewd about his self-image, he said, look at Ted Bundy, five books and a TV movie. Where did that get him? You know, like he was thinking, well, what should, trying to figure out how do you make a career out of being the Night Stalker? Um, uh, what, there was a rumor, or actually LeVay, Zena's father, had told us that he recalled one day that Richard was outside the Black House, which was LeVay's house in San Francisco, and that, that, that he had a conversation with him, and he said he was very respectful and polite to him. Now, Anton LeVay never opened his mouth without lying, so whether that was true or not, I don't know, but mm -hmm. we asked Richard that in that first meeting, and he said, honestly, I don't remember. I was so fucked up then, I could have. And he made it very clear that through that whole 84 to 85 period before he was arrested, he was high every single day. He couldn't remember half of what he did. Um, wow. You know, he was totally high all the time, and, and a lot of the crimes even were committed when he was completely, you know, stoned on, on everything, mixture yeah. of everything. Um, so he didn't remember if that happened or not. Wow. Um, he, he knew, he had, he had seen, uh, by that time already, some clips of my interview with Charlie had been on Current Affair and other sensational trash TV talk shows at the time. So he had seen them and he admired Manson actually probably for the wrong reasons I don't you know I don't think he understood the reality of the crimes but he he looked up to him and admired him and wanted me to give his regards to Charlie and um, and he said and I don't I don't know what he was referring to but he said I understand some people of my race had burned him I think he mean burned him in the criminal sense like ripped him off or something, but he should know not all of us feel that way about him. So he wanted me to give that message to Charles, which I did because I was in very steady contact with Charlie at that time. What um, was Charlie's response? He, he didn't give a damn about it. He didn't, he, he'd listened, he was polite, but, and he said, yeah, say hello too. But 
but he did not i don't want to get into that but he did not respect serial killers or it wasn't a racial thing because he actually charlie liked mexicans actually he very mm -hmm. much was pro mexico and 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 preferred the company of mexicans um but he really looked down like most real criminals and people in the underworld have contempt for serial killers because serial killers have no control over themselves. They're not disciplined. They're not professionals. They're, they're just lunatics who, who can't okay. hold their shit together. So in the prison hierarchy, serial killers just one step above child molester. And okay. people didn't know, people didn't know at that point publicly that Richard was a child molester and that he had raped children and killed children. And interestingly, though he told us all about his crimes later, he never admitted that to us. We didn't know that when we knew him. So he, there was a barrier. I think he realized that we would not go beyond. So okay. I think it's interesting that he edited himself to a degree and didn't tell yeah. us about that. Um, let's see. Uh, he, uh, when we asked him, like, what was his satanic background or how he got into it, he just, he admit he he didn't put on airs. He wasn't pretentious. He said, I, you know, I just was always drawn to the devil. I always thought that I serve the devil. I was brought to this earth to serve him, and um, and he he asked us about. Obviously, there was some group he had some dealings with because he said, I knew some people in San Pedro. Are you familiar with those areas? Some people that were into Satanism. I and mean, he said he kind of watched their rituals from afar, but didn't really get involved. And I got the impression he was, I, I guess you could say, very introverted and shy in his dealings with people. Again, like a wild animal. I mean, he went yeah. out at night and stole stuff and got drugs and killed people, but he didn't have any real dealings with human beings uh except prostitutes i mean like the only feminine company in his life were, were the cheapest street whores that like he would buy with some cocaine or something that was as much human warmth as yeah. he had and he described all that when we got to know him quite openly he talked about his sexual fetishes in great detail and he had no shame at all he had no no filter you know, and that's very rare. Yeah, that is rare. Um, re be right before, well, not right before, but in Halloween of that, the year before, we had been on the Geraldo Rivera Satan's Underground, this, this special that really pushed the satanic panic thing into high gear. And he watched everything we did on TV, and you know, he would lay, he'd call us and say, oh, that was really good, I like that part even ordered the transcript. In those days, you could write to the TV show and order a transcript. And he would say, oh, Nicholas, I liked it when you said this or that. Too. Like, I remember, I said, I, I forget, I said some sarcastic thing to one of the hosts that it made him laugh. So he was like a fan in a way, which was interesting. Yeah. Um, and so about, he said, I thought you guys did really good on the Geraldo show. The only thing I didn't agree with was with what that Aquino was saying, which was Michael Aquino of the Temple of Set. Probably because he was, I mean, Aquino was the goody-goody Satanist who was always stressing the ethical nature of it and all that. So, of course, Richard would not find that appealing. So that that's the first page of many notes. I, I can't wow. remember them. But I just thought to give you a direct idea of what we talked about. And then um, then very quickly after that, he and I forget who really thought of it first together, we, he wanted us to write his autobiography or to write a book with him about his life from his point of view, not a typical true crime book. Strangely, a little bit like when Manson was disappointed with um, Manson in his own words, and he said, yeah. well, why can't you write that? But this would have been like we would, Zena, him, and me, we worked together on telling what his whole life story was from his point of view, mm -hmm. not the typical true crime thing that, you know, that would begin with Los Angeles was in a state of fear. And yeah. what was his experience of what he was going through, which is very rarely 
done. You never hear the, the criminal's point of view. You hear it's from the point of view of society. And, and he was, so we agreed to do that. And then our meetings became more frequent. Our telephone calls became much more frequent. And he, you know, he talked about all parts of his life. He talked about, uh, he talked quite candidly about that he could have brain damage. That what, why? Well, one thing I should say, he he uh, in his total lack of remorse for the murders, he said after he got to know us. He, I remember a phone call. He said, um, "You know, I really like you guys, and you're my friends. But if it's nighttime, and if we were together, and I was out, I might kill you." And he said, "I can't." He, he, there was a little bit of shame that he couldn't control himself. It was like, I wish I, I could control that, but it, it was like he felt he had to tell us that. Yeah. And, and it was really a compulsion. He could, he, and also he talked about this very openly, that it was a sexual fetish, he, that he, he was sexually excited by murdering people, and that he even ejaculated when he killed people. And yeah, he told that's us all this. Yeah, he told us that quite openly. So it was, you know, he was motivated by stealing money for drugs, but he got a sexual thrill out of it, and he admitted it. You know, so so he talked about, he, he didn't remember the details of which victim was which, and, you know, uh, he was completely lacking in any empathy for his victims. He had no pity whatsoever. And I want to emphasize that for that there are many people now, decades later, who romanticize him and idealize him. And even idiots who say he was innocent, he was framed, uh, you know, or, 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 you know, there's these girls who are in love with him, um, as there also are for Ted Bundy repulsively, which is unbelievable to me, but there are. Yeah. Um, who, who, oh, he, he had such a bad childhood, and if only he'd known me, I, you know, he, that they, so I just want to say, yeah, you know, he was my friend. I got along with him on a human level, but he was a despicable person who had absolutely no empathy for anyone and would have even killed us. He'd right. Heard of it. I mean, yeah. he, he was a killing machine. He, there was something deeply wrong with him. I mean, he was not, a raving psychotic by any means. And that was what was interesting. He was articulate. He was intelligent, though uneducated. He was bright. You know, he had a sense of humor. He didn't act like a drooling lunatic, um, but he could not control his urge to kill. And he enjoyed it, and he was totally sadistic about it. I mean, he wanted to cause pain, and he reveled in that. Yeah. Where you were so. his friend on the outside and people knew that because you were at his trial, did you ever have any conversations with any, like you said, any of these women that do romanticize him, whether that was back then or even still to this day? Oh yes. Im immediately. I mean, at the trial, there were, there were always groupies uh, at the trial immediately. Um, and that gave it a circus like strange, atmosphere and our presence there too unnerved people as the word spread that we were there so there were and they talked to us too they would like politely come up to us and express their admiration or whatever like the news people did and and we did talk to them and one uh there's a musician named ava o who came from the same gothic rock and death rock milieu that radio werewolf came from um and she actually had a romantic affiliation with Richard that was much deeper than, than these other women who, who were groupies for him. I mean, she, she got to know him very well, and, she, and I knew her, and, and yeah, we talked about that. Um, but to this day, and really it's never stopped, although it's since the Netflix documentary, it's... I mean, in all of the late 80s, 90s, and 2000s, I always got contacted by almost entirely these women who, who are in love with him and, and want, you know, to know any little detail about him and, and all of that. And I still do, you know, this, this week, several, at least 
you know, it, it happens all the time. There's many of them out there, and I try to dissuade them from romanticizing him and idealizing him and, and thinking that there's any redeeming quality about him, because there's none. I mean, in his brief life, he did nothing but wreak horror and tragedy and, and pain. That's it. Yeah. You know. It's interesting, because it says so much about the women, more so than Richard, from a psychology point of view, I, I would I would say. Mm -hmm. but, well, I mean, as a woman, how do you feel about that? I mean, this is a person who enjoyed raping women and insulting them while he was raping them and have, you know, making them say how much they enjoy being raped. And, and he, you know, whatever, he used women, I mean, like a lot of convicts. And I've known he wasn't that different than many other prisoners. When you're in prison, you're bored out of your mind. And if you've got a bunch of women talking to you, that's a lot more entertaining than sitting in your cell jerking off, which is what most prisoners have to do. Yeah. So, it's so fascinating. You know, he but he didn't respect these women. You know, it was clear to me and to Zena. You know, he he used them, and he used them for porn pornographic purposes too. He'd say, "Send me, oh. you know, send me your pussy, send me your feet." Especially, he had a. He had a foot fetish, and he would always ask every woman, send me pictures of your feet, send me... And they did. I was about to they say, did. and I'm sure they did. They absolutely did. And then the other prisoners who already hated him because he was on the lower rung of the prison hierarchy as a serial killer. who kill Killing women is really not admired in the criminal underworld. That's looked at as cowardly. Mm -hmm. um, and so they hated him anyway. And... He was kept away from the from the jail and prison population because of his notoriety. But, yeah. you know, the other prisoners envied him and hated him because he had all these women writing to him and sending him, you know, porn pornographic pictures and, and love letters and that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah I've, it's very disturbing. It is still disturbing to me. And and they, they've created a fantasy Richard Ramirez that did not exist, a, a one who would you know, to them would be a sweet, loving little pussycat and not a vicious psychopathic murderer, which he was. Yeah, there's a, um, a topic called hybristophilia where, and we covered it once um, a few months back on the podcast, the Manson Saga discussion panel, just about this very subject about, because right. it does cross where there are some men that are infatuated with women prisoners, but statistically speaking, it is women that are infatuated with male prisoners. Mm -hmm. And studies that have been done about that in the psychology behind the type of woman um, that would be attracted to a male inmate and why, what type of background they'd come from to lead up to that. It's a whole fascinating subject. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, what, what, what earlier, would you what would you what would you say is the main type? Because I've certainly got to observe it close up. I have my own theories. What what do you think? What what is the psychological mechanism that makes people do that it can be a combination in my personal opinion based on that research i would say it's a mix of wanting the fame as well you can be you you get a little bit of notoriety through what could be your partner also women purposely seeking men who are unattainable they know that it's somebody from a distance that's, that's what i think yeah yeah and statistically speaking, a lot of these women come from very um, bro broken homes, damaged backgrounds. It's rare that a woman comes from from just a, I hate to say, quote unquote, normal household because there's really no yeah. such thing as or normal. Or e even loving or supportive or affectionate yeah. household. But yeah. sometimes that does happen. And that's that's a whole fascinating look at itself. But I would say it's a mix of, I would say, low self-esteem. And wanting mm -hmm. somebody that you can be famous with and be under their limelight and somebody that you know is unattainable. Because think about it. Richard Ramirez, he wasn't in jail his whole life. When he was out and about, where were these women then? Mm -hmm. Oh, he he was very aware of that. He said he had no luck with women. I mean, he he had to go to prostitutes to... I mean, he would, he would have no idea to have courtship or socialize i mean he did have some he i guess you know in texas in el paso when he was growing up he did have some kind of girlfriends but they were not 
successful or loving relationships at all. And yeah, I mean, yeah. So I want to get into like uh, his psychology in that respect. But as far as these women that are attracted to them, what I see is exactly what you're saying. It's they, they, it's, they can't, for the most part, not all of them, they could never have a real relationship in the outer world with a real man. They, so they, it's, it's very easy to have a fantasy relationship with someone that you can only meet, you know, with guards there to protect you from them. Yeah. Um, or, or on the, you know, or write letters. And so it's, it's easy to project whatever fantasy you want, but these are mostly damaged women from dysfunctional backgrounds, very often with father issues. And, yes. um, and they, they, they create, a fantasy boyfriend like an imaginary playmate and like you say there has to be a certain amount of low self-esteem to i mean what what is richard ramirez's achievements nothing you know right. that he killed he killed random people who who he had contempt for because they were stupid enough in his words to not lock their doors or windows and he yep. he figured well they anyone that does that deserves to die yeah I mean, well, and it's a control what, what? thing too, because these women will know that he's, I know where to find him. You know, it's a control right. thing. I know he'll be there. You know, he's not going to, I think a lot of them think he won't go cheat on me with somebody else when in reality. Oh, exactly. Oh, you know. well, I've known, uh, I've known other women that just, they like prisoners, not, they don't even have to be famous prisoners. And that's always the case. Uh, this has happened often. They'll say, oh, he really loves me and he cares about me. And he, you know, he says, I'm the only one. And I said, you are so deluded. You have no idea, you know. And and I've even talked to other prisoners that knew the same prisoner. And they'd say, no, they're talking to 50 girls just like that. Yeah. And they tell, like, like a pimp, they tell them, oh, yeah, you're my only girl. So, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of self-delusion, low self-esteem. Uh, and it's, you know, there's no risk in having a relationship. And in a way, you are controlling someone who could kill you it, as far mm -hmm. as the control mechanism, because they know this guy's bored. They know secretly he doesn't give a damn about you, but he, and you know, he calls you or he writes a letter to you. So you have some kind of, uh, you've entered their life in some way and you have some sort of power over them. But yeah. But as far as his own psychology and yes, dysfunctionality please. and broken, he was quite open about that he had um, two brain injuries that he, he had fallen when he was a little kid. He would, I, I, I don't remember the whole story. He was reaching for something high up on a shelf and fell and, and was unconscious and had to get, I think, 30 stitches to put his head back together. And he, he, had no doubt that that caused damage to him. Um, and then he had another very bad head injury, which Richard Speck, the guy who killed the nurses in 1966, was constantly banging his head through his whole life, you know. And so a lot of, a lot of this behavior comes from real brain damage. Mm -hmm. Secondly, his mother worked at a shoe factory that used toxic... Um, glue and there was no protection no masks nothing because they were you know paying paid less than minimum wage his parents were very poor in El Paso Texas and um, and all of her many of her kids died because of this toxic fumes before him okay and and he was aware of that and he, he was able to look at himself objectively enough to speculate that maybe the fumes got to him while, he, while she was pregnant. So the, yeah. you had those things. Then his uncle, Mike Ramirez, was a Vietnam veteran, complete sadist and maniac. And clearly then there's a genetic component to this Satanist, to not, not Satanism, sadism yes. and, hate, and hatred of women and misogyny. Um, because Mike Ramirez in Vietnam, like unfortunately many U.S. soldiers, used the fog of war to go, to rape and kill Vietnamese women 
and he did, and he took pictures of them, Polaroids, that he showed Richard when Richard was young, and he showed pictures of decapitated heads of, you know, and the U.S. Army looked the other way when this these kind of uh, atrocities happened, and Mike Ramirez killed his wife in front of Richard. Yeah, He shot her, and that is a trauma that, you know, you had head injuries, possible chemical poisoning, and the, the influence of his uncle, Mike, who was showing him, here's how you kill women, and it's fun, here's how you rape women. He trained him to be that way. And his father, though his father didn't beat him or abuse him, he was an angry alcoholic, you know, very unloving household. And so Richard moved away when he was 15 to Los Angeles and s- survived on the street. Uh, and he told us all this. You know, he, he learned how to pickpocket. He learned how to steal. Um, and he got involved with the auto theft ring at the Los Angeles train terminal, the main train station. And that's been true since the 30s. The parking lot of the Los Angeles train terminal was always like a like a used auto showroom for stolen vehicles. And he was part of that. So he got involved in the traditional criminal, the lowest, you know, gutter level of the underworld. And he survived that way. And then he started killing. And and it seems to what he said, the more he got addicted to crack, he smoked crack cocaine, which was very popular in the 80s, and, yeah. uh, and heroin and speed and anything if he got whatever pills someone would have anything at all he was stoned all the time and smoking weed all the time constantly and that seems to be what precipitated the the killing although it began as i said in san francisco with this killing of a of a little girl which yeah. he never spoke to us about so so he was he was aware enough of himself to know that these things made him the way he was, but he was he was not remorseful about who he was at all and what he was. That's fascinating. So never, I was gonna say, so never once, whether it was by phone or by in person meetings with him, um, no sign of the no sign of a hint of remorse at all. No, his only remorse was he really, he was angry at himself for being caught. That's it. Yeah, remorse for himself. Yeah, and and again, this was on a, on a religious belief, right or wrong, that he served Satan, he did evil deeds for Satan, and therefore, ultimately, Satan would reward him. And so I don't forget, I should mention this, that we're zipping ahead into the, the future. Um in 2013, I was doing a Buddhist retreat, and I was in, in my own home, but I wasn't contacting anyone, not talking to anyone, no phone calls, no email, nothing, absolutely nothing. I cut off everything and was only meditating and doing certain Buddhist practices. And during this time, when I had no contact with absolutely anyone, I had a very vivid dream that uh, I, I was in a very clinical, white, it looked like a morgue or, or a school, very desolate and, and a, a mood of horrible, depressing, like, you know, the worst bureaucracy you could imagine. That was the feeling of it. And it was like a very, very clean and white and very brightly, harshly lit with fluorescent lights like between a morgue and a high school cafeteria. Okay. Uh, and a very long line of people, very long, unbelievably long line of people in front of me going on seemingly for miles. Uh, and then Richard was right in front of me, but the younger Richard, not the Richard in his 50s that he was in 2013, the w- Richard that I had met. And he turned around to me and he said, and he said, oh, man, hey, I, I figured you'd be down here. I thought I'd meet you down here. And we were in hell. And I knew we really were. We really were. And I knew, well, okay, if you're in hell, you're dead. I knew, you know, I thought that. 
And I, I said, I'm not, I'm not staying. I'm here to try to get you out. And he said, oh, that's not going to happen. And then, and then he, and he said, you know, it was very casual, like, well, good to see you, man. I figured I'd see you down here. And then he moved to, like a prisoner, like an institutionalized prisoner, moved along the line and obviously going into hell. Wow. And then when my Buddhist retreat was over, I went out and Zena said to me, Richard died. And I said, when? And it was that day. That's wild. Yeah. And it, I have no doubt it, that was the last time I saw him. It, I, it happened. It was real. That's wild. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, one of the questions I had for you, and you, you've touched upon a few things in regards to how Richard was in front of a camera versus behind the scenes. What are some things about Richard that the media and the public got wrong about him? If there is any. Um, well, that, that, that he, the media doesn't want to admit that he was performing for the cameras. I mean, he, he, he could, I mean, sure, that was a part of his personality, but, you know, he, he, he loved the ad, the adulation and the groupies and the ad, you know, that the, the kind of negative attention he got, he, he liked the media to describe how horrible he was, mm -hmm. you know, the, the more, the more negative attention he got, the better. What I, what I would say now, when I met him, he was intelligent. He was reading books, all kinds of books, not just satanic occult books, but all kinds of things. He was, he was intellectually curious. He did have, valid critiques of society i mean like for instance he he often said well what really when it comes down to it why are governments allowed to kill millions of people in horrible ways but i'm a monster if i do it it's a legitimate question i mean what is yeah. the difference that that it has that it and he was and he meant it he wasn't just being you know, provocative, he was saying, well, what is really the difference? Because I killed 20 something people and they kill thousands with the push of a button. So what is the, so one of the main things he said is, or that he was concerned with is the, the hypocrisy of society looking at the criminal and the serial killer as the worst problem in society, but not looking at war or the armaments industry or you know, the, the glorification of violence in films and everything. Like, well, why do you keep selling movies about people getting killed and horror movies? And, you know, if it's, if it's so horrible, then don't, don't encourage it. So he had social ideas. I mean, other things I think that would, like, he was very aware of his Mexican heritage and very proud of the Aztecs for their brutality and there, the, he was very aware of the sacrificing, and also he, which is true, like okay, there was a whole civilization for, you know, a very long period of time that was based on killing people, pulling their hearts out, and sacrificing them. So, yeah. So he was very like thinking in terms of moral relativism. Why am I so evil and so monstrous if these other things? have happened um mm -hmm. yeah I, I now as he got not even a little bit older you know the the amount of intravenous drugs he used and drug use in general and drinking blood occasionally which he told us he did and and other danger and also sleeping with street prostitutes you know with no protection he got hepatitis c um, from that and that's what ultimately killed him and he he was not I don't know if they tried to treat him or what because we drifted out of touch once we moved back to Europe um, and when was that but, when did you move back in relation to before he we, 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 we really when we left well, I'll, I'll get to that I'll get okay. to that um, <laughs> because there's a final part of our our friendship with him that we had some like very occasionally he'd send a letter years later or a phone call, but it, it really, our friendship, as we 
distanced ourselves from occultism and Satanism, we, we really didn't have that much to do with them after a while. Okay. But um, now what was your question right before that? Was what the public, you know, the good um, oh, the yeah. That well, the public and the media got yeah, wrong. Good, 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 I can't say good, but uh, yeah. yeah, I would just say that he was more intelligent, more had a more lively uh, curiosity about things in the world, was, you know, humorous. He had a self deprecation. He was, you know, most psychotic people have no sense of humor at all, I've noticed. They have none. He wasn't, he didn't display to me or to Zena any really signs of being out of touch with reality. Although other prisoners I spoke to and, and some of guards said he did. And so I've read his psychiatric reports. He definitely acted completely crazy, but I never saw any sign of that. And we talked to him in many different conditions. He, I would say he seemed pretty sound of mind for the most part. Interesting. He didn't have insane schizophrenic type ideas about reality compared to most people, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would say. And, and, you know, he was very conscious of I am a celebrity and I'm playing up this Richard Ramirez act. Yeah. Not, not to the extent of Charlie, who was the master of that and who, who was like on 15,000 different levels of playing different games. But he certainly thought like I'm going to act I've, I have this character I'm going to play of the Night Stalker. Uh, one thing I don't think a lot of people are aware of, when he was convicted, he, he, uh, during a visit, he said, can you, um, can you and Zena help me to, to write my statement to the court? Because he's allowed. So we, we collaborated with him on postcards back and forth on what his final statement would be. So we wrote about 50% of his final statement according to what he wanted, not what we thought. Well, we, like we took it like a writing job. Well, what, what do you want to say? And he told us generally, and we tried to put it in more poetic language. So Zena and I wrote half of his statement and he wrote half of it. So this thing where he says legions of the night, you know, and I'm beyond good and evil, which you can easily find that statement. Yeah. We we wrote that with him. Wow. I did yeah. not know that. That is fascinating. And he and he looked at it like like he's kind of like in show business. Like it wasn't like he didn't even care that he got convicted to be killed. It didn't it truly didn't matter to him at all. It meant nothing. He's thought, well, what's what's a cool thing to say though? You know. Yeah. Well, putting again, putting it on for the camera. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So you had talked about how you and Richard, once you started to step away um, from the satanic uh, religion, that you guys kind of drifted apart, and right. how his poor. Well, we also was moved. We moved him. to Europe, and we couldn't really visit him. And and uh, you, at that time, it was very difficult to make phone calls. To mm -hmm. Europe, same same with uh, Charlie Manson could only write to us. I mean, before that, I talked to him when we moved to Europe. For the most part, he could never call, and mm -hmm. later later he could when technology changed a bit. But yeah, so that was part of the problem was just uh, logistic. It, you know, we were used to talking to him, not writing to him. So yeah. he would call quite frequently when we lived okay. in Los Angeles. Um, the final act in our knowing him was interesting, which show, says something about the insanity of our lives. Uh, we were doing a radio werewolf performance on April 30th, which is Valpurgis Noct of 1990. Uh, it was at uh, a beautiful ballroom in downtown LA at this hotel. And it was by invitation, not invitation only, but you had to get because of the controversy of our concerts at that point and the satanic panic, it was not even announced publicly. It was a privately held concert for 600, 600, 666 people. And it sold out immediately. And we had befriended the homicide detective from the Los Angeles Police Department named 
Detective Pat Matoyer. And how that happened was because the satanic panic harassment of us had gotten so intense, we actually had to make a point, an appointment with the homicide department. He, he was like Van Helsing. He was like a crusader going out to battle Satanism. <laughs> and we met with him and said, look, we are not doing a damn thing illegal at all. So stop it. You know, we're not, we're not killing babies. We're not doing ritual sacrifice. We're not doing any of this. And he believed us. I mean, we had a very frank meeting at the homicide department with cops around us running back and forth. And, you know, um, and he took the time to do it. And he was kind of intrigued by it because he had never talked to real live Satanists. And then we became friendly with him. And he said, well, okay, we'll back off on this. And, you know, thank you for enlightening me to that. Like, well, he'd say, well, what are your beliefs then? And, and he tried to be as understanding as he could. So we reached a rapprochement with him. Then he said, will you help us when there are crimes that have occult symbols or any kind of magical or, or esoteric symbolism? Could you look at the crime scene photos and, and notes and help us to, you know, to interpret them, so to find clues. We said, sure. And we did. So he became a friend. I mean, he'd call us just to have a conversation or joke around about things. Very morbid, too. He'd say he'd describe what crime scene he was at or that kind of thing. Uh, when we had this concert, he called us one day, very serious, and said, look, the sheriff's department, which is different than the LAPD, as you may know from your looking into the Manson yes. thing, and they hate each other and they have a rivalry, or they did. He said, the sheriff's department is going to arrest you on stage if you do this performance and frame you. And he, he knew about this for something, so I'm telling you about it. Shortly thereafter, Richard called us early in the morning, like you get up early in the morning in, in prison. It was, he was in San Quentin by then after his sentence had begun. And, and he woke us up really early in the morning. And he said, look, uh, someone, a federal agent was here to interview me this morning. They came in to talk to me and I thought they were here to talk to me about other crimes, which he admitted there were murders that had not and maybe never will be known. And he said, I, I thought, well, they're, they're waking me up to like interrogate me. And he said, but no, they were here to talk about you guys. They were here to talk to me about you. And, and he said, uh, I'll never forget the intensity when he said, man, they are after your ass. Why? He, war he was warning us. Well, the satanic panic madness mm -hmm. of that time. I mean, people think it was fun and games, you know, and it, it was not. We were at war yeah. with our own society. And, and, you know, people talk about freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Well, we saw that, you know, try to exercise it in a way that is not acceptable. No, there is no freedom of speech or religion. So, so you got a homicide detective and Richard Ramirez calling us to warn us. Um, and we left America shortly thereafter that. I mean, we were, we had seen through it a long time before that, but that, that was very important in saying, okay, this, this is not the land of the free yeah. at all. And, uh, and so that was, I mean, we continued to talk to him a bit. Now, another thing we had agreed to do this book with him. Mm -hmm. his biography and so a lot of then our conversations became okay let's go through your childhood let's go through your parents let's go through you know uh, everything psychology experiences all of it the crimes a great deal you know what how did you start doing it what were you thinking and and he was quite candid and then at a certain point like most criminals and he was still ultimately a thief and a street criminal, he said, I want you to send this, I forget how much it was, ungodly, unaffordable amount to my parents. 
I want, you know, because he did have a degree of shame that he had destroyed his parents' life by making them known as the, the mother and father of the Night Stalker, you right. know. It, which is interesting because I believe he was a psychopath. He had very little empathy, but he warned us. He saw us as his friends and he thought to warn us, which shows the kind of empathy. And he felt enough uh, shame about his parents that he wanted them to be compensated. So he said to do the book, I want, and also I was going to do an interview with him in prison, as I did with Charles, which he agreed to because he. He really liked the interview I did with Charlie. Um, so we were going to do all that. But then we said, Richard, we are not going to pay your parents this ungodly sum. You know, that's just ridiculous. And he didn't get offended. But so then the project ended because he insisted it has to be on that basis. So we said, all right, well, then we've done this work for nothing. We're not going to do that. And um, then, then he got more crook-like and like can the next time you come can you guys smuggle in some weed for me and i you know we said you know with all this negative attention we have already that's the last thing we need right. is to be caught smuggling weed to the night stalker so no and it, he didn't you know he accepted that but it created a little bit of coolness and, and then he found other women i know who did do that for him um okay you mentioned richard's parents that he wanted them compensated in some way did they after he was um arrested or even sentenced did they have any relationship with him yes they talked to him and i believe they visited him mm -hmm. okay yeah I never, I, I didn't talk much about him. He didn't like really talking about his family, but we did get him to tell us what, what he would. He clearly was very reticent about that. Yeah. But yeah, he wanted them compensated. So, you know, so our friendship continued, but without the professional um, goal of writing this book or making a, a documentary. And then we left for Europe in 1990 and really didn't have much contact with him again, very briefly. Like when we moved back to America, he sent us one or two letters. But another thing I have to point out, I was mentioning this, the illness, the hepatitis. Mm -hmm. Not shortly, it didn't take long. His inte in intellectual capacity diminished. He was intelligent and bright and articulate, and he got dumber and less articulate as he got older very quickly. And it seemed to me that the hepatitis, you know, it, it fucks up your liver yep. and it, it doesn't, then blood doesn't get to your brain. And I don't know if it was damage from the drugs or what, but he became more simple minded, honestly, as he got older. Like I see letters, the letters he wrote us were fairly complicated and about philosophical or social things, maybe because he was writing to us who he had a rapport with. But his letters, like if you look at them, they're very mundane. Like, what movies do you like? Uh, what's your favorite food? What they're like, they don't really reveal anything about the person I knew. And yeah. you may know that in the later stage of his life, he was, he had deteriorated so badly mentally that he couldn't even have visitors because mm -hmm. he would masturbate compulsively in front of them and the guards would have to pull him back and eventually they they said you can't visit him anymore so he just sat in his cell and um and also he was extremely isolated not only be even before that because of his extreme notoriety i believe the the classification is k1 which is also called keep away, meaning keep him away from other prisoners. If he was taken to a doctor's appointment or down the hallway for uh, whatever, they, there had to be three people guarding him, a sheriff you know, or a sergeant rather guarding him. And he really didn't have much contact with other prisoners. And the prisoners he did contact, he very often tried to frighten and terrify by threatening them or 
as is well known, he'd show them the crime scene pictures that his defense attorneys gave him to show them what he had done. Wow. So, yeah. And uh, I heard a story from a law enforcement contact that I have that when he was first in there, they would the, the cops or the guards would mockingly call him Ricky. They'd say, you know, like, Ricky, your lunch is ready. And, he, and he'd say, I'm not Ricky. This is the house of Satan. So, but there was, you know, he, he, his life in prison was terrible because he was hated. Yeah. The guards hated him. The prisoners hated him. And the only relief he had really were these groupies and, you know, them admiring him while everyone else is hating him. So, yeah. And once visitors stopped, then, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've heard stories from that, like he really was very far gone at the end, and and he ended up dying in a hospital in Marin. He didn't die in prison. Yeah. And I I saw the descriptions of it. I tried to even find out from the guards, but what I heard was that he was bright green by the time he died, like you know, very horrific condition. Yeah. What so was. He, Okay. So he he deteriorated so much. I don't know that we could have continued our friendship with him. Yeah. What was your last conversation with Richard, if you recall the very last one? I don't, it was very banal. It was it was when we were leaving to go to Austria, and we call. We I mean, he would call us. I I think it seemed to me mostly on the weekends. Um, he'd call just about every week for, for a long time. And so it was to say goodbye to him that we're going to Austria. And, but it was, you know, it's nothing special. You never know when you're having your last conversation. Usually. Right. But I remember it was that there were quite a few calls with people who, um, who we knew we wouldn't see for a while. Yeah. So there but it wasn't anything, anything dramatic, you know, you, you, you never are aware when the last moment will be with someone. Yeah, that is very true. As a lot of people who met him found out. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there's a very, I mean, as you know, even though you're not, as you said, into necessarily true crime yourself, the whole true crime genre is, um, it's huge right now. There's, I mean, like you said, you referenced earlier, the Netflix documentary. Right. So there, with this fascination about true crime, a lot of these big name serial killers, like you mentioned earlier, Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, um, John Wayne Gacy, Ed Gein, so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of documentaries and a lot of movies and books that come out. Anytime that there is a documentary or whatnot about Richard, how, do you watch any of them because you once knew him? Especially this most recent Netflix documentary. Just, just, a, I, just a little bit. Not really. I mean... I know what was in it, and I have watched little clips of things that people sent me. Um, mm -hmm. But no, I mean, like I don't. In the same way, I don't. I I look like a new Manson book comes out. I'll look at it for two minutes unless it has something. You know, it. I I don't trust the media. I I I know how they have misrepresented me constantly, and still do. Uh, I, I look at the newspapers like, well, I mean, I know what kind of liars and exaggerators and, you know, and, and most of these, like, I know how TV shows are made. It's some hack who's not really even interested in the subject. Here's our project. You want to write this? And they research it for a few weeks. And, you know, nothing is in depth. So, you know, yeah. Like, I don't even look at stuff about myself in any great detail, you know, because you, when, once you see the media's game, you can't take it seriously anymore. So, yeah. no, I have, I, now, the book that we were going to write about him, there was a book called The Night Stalker by Philip Carlo, which is one of the first books. I, I don't even know if there are other books about him. That's how little... I mean, I know what he told me. I experienced yeah. a real person, so I don't need it mediated between someone else. Um, yeah. And this guy, Philip Carlo, I think he probably did pay his parents or do he must have agreed to do something to get. And it's just an ordinary true crime book with no particular. I don't know if you've read it. Mm -hmm. And in it, he, um, he, he describes Zena and I being at the trial and he describes us 
you know, and he puts us in the chapter like about the satanic groupies and stuff and makes it sound like we went there because we admired him so much, which is completely not true. And, um, and he also says, which also this idiot writer, Dave McGowan, has said, he's one of the people that wrote that I cut my ear off as a sacrifice to Satan. So we had this place called Hell House of Hollywood. It was a wax museum on Hollywood Boulevard. And the Discovery Channel was making a documentary about Richard at that time, or I don't think it was a full documentary, but at least a, a fairly lengthy episode of some show. And they came there and interviewed us. And we had a wax figure of Richard made by the very famous wax um, master named Henry Alvarez. Um, I can send you a picture of it. Maybe you can show it on your, in, the, in this broadcast. Um, that would be great. So they came there because of that. And they interviewed me. And Philip Carlo, the author of The Night Stalker, came in to the store and saw Zena and I. And when we saw him after the idiotic things he had written about us, we turned on him like two hyenas. Like, we, he, there could have been another murder, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and, he, and he was terrified and he left. So it was funny. We had some kind of poet. But... Why he would think we would greet him in a friendly way yeah. after the stupidity he had written. But, but that happens quite often. You know, we, you become demonized and dehumanized and people just think you're fodder for whatever nonsense they want to say. They don't even realize you might be offended if, you, if you're being lied about. But that happens all the time. It happens to this day constantly. So, yeah. But that was our dealings with Philip Carlo. But yeah, I don't. I don't keep up, you know, if someone told me some new information, I, I would look at it. But like we did, we did not know that he was raping little girls and kidnapping little girls. And he never talked about that. Yeah, I find that that little detail very fascinating that he would be so open about everything else. But mm -hmm. that he, so. he, he, he didn't lie about it because we didn't know about it, but he certainly evaded it. He never and he. I mean, he talked in detail about, about too much information about his sexual fetishes and what mm -hmm. turned him on and, and what didn't and what kind of women he liked and didn't. So, yeah, yeah I think that's very telling that he, he knew that there's a, a, a boundary you can't cross. Yeah. Also, of course, if you said that in prison, you'd really be dead. Very true. So I, think I was just saying for somebody that, who lacked a very social a time when you learn those social norms and social skills, just the basic ones, he missed out on all of that, but somewhere along the line knew that one piece to keep to himself. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what made him interesting in a way was that he was a completely, you know, unsocialized person. He, he was, he, th there was no social filter. He was not civilized in any way. I mean, Maybe he is that maybe he's what human beings would be without society, without culture, without civilization. Yeah. Leaving aside the probable brain damage and drug abuse. But, you know, and that's, I think, what he thought. He said, well, I'm I'm doing he believed everyone would do what he did if they could. I don't think that's true, but yeah, we wouldn't have, we the human race wouldn't have survived. But not right. that we're doing a very good job of doing that and we may not but yeah so yes he did have some that was the only filter i can think he had he understood child raping and molesting would probably uh not go over that well yeah so as we kind of wrap up richard ramirez and your relationship with him are there any other points about him that you want to let us know that we can take away from this or do you think we kind of well, really covered Richard as, as I think I think we covered most of it I'm going to write a little bit more about it in a book about my entire the whole spectrum of my experiences with Satanism in general and there will be a lengthy chapter getting into a bit more detail but I think I think the media generally like unless the lowest sensational media People treat his Satanism like it was just an affectation or, or like a, a stupid 
uh, appreciation of heavy metal or something. But I would say it really was serious. It, he, he was intensely interested in it. I think he was not as he got late, later in life. I think he kind of dropped that from what I gather from other people who remained mm. in correspondence with him. I, don't, I think he didn't identify himself that way in the later part of his life so much. But I'd say when I knew him, he was intensely, really, and genuinely interested in it. And, and you can't ignore or pretend that it didn't have an effect on what he did. He, he, believed, commit, he believed that doing evil was good. Yeah. He really believed that, and he wanted to do that. He wanted to be evil, um, and and you know, as far as this dream I had, from what I understand of the spiritual world, if you commit these kind of crimes and you create the kind of pain for the for his victims and for their families, and and the fear that he created in all of Los Angeles, I mean, which he delighted in, he loved it, he wanted. Mm -hmm to make people frightened. He was thrilled and, and excited by that. Then you're going to be in hell. That's where yeah. you're going to go immediately, immediately. And he is definitely in agony and anguish at this moment because of what he did. Yeah. Not him, not Richard Ramirez, but whatever he has become, his consciousness is was instantly reborn in the hell realms as it's known in Buddhism and Hinduism. And um, he will be there for a very long time because of what he did. So far from being rewarded for his brief time on earth, there's no reward there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nicholas, so much for coming on Danny After Dark and sharing your, your experience and your relationship with Richard Ramirez. It was very right. enlightening. I'm hoping our audience took away something that... They didn't know. I sure took away things that I didn't know. So thank you so much. And it thank was, you everybody for watching this. And we will see you next time. It was Bye. my pleasure. Thank you for the thank conversation for, and for, for inviting me. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.